Chapter 6 of The Problems of Philosophy by Bertrand Russell. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Landon D.C. Elkind at the University of Iowa in Coralville, Iowa. Recorded at the Bertrand Russell Archives in McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario. Chapter 6 on Induction In almost all our previous discussions, we have been concerned in the attempt to get clear as to our data in the way of knowledge of existence. What things are there in the universe whose existence is known to us, owing to our being acquainted with them? So far, our answer has been that we are acquainted with our sense data, and probably with ourselves. These we know to exist, and past sense data, which are remembered, are known to have existed in the past. This knowledge supplies our data. But if we are to be able to draw inferences from these data, if we are to know the existence of matter, of other people, of the past before our individual memory begins, or of the future, we must know general principles of some kind by means of which such inferences can be drawn. It must be known to us that the existence of some one sort of thing, A, is a sign of the existence of some other sort of thing, B, either at the same time as A or at some earlier or later time, as, for example, thunder is a sign of the earlier existence of lightning. If this were not known to us, we could never extend our knowledge beyond the sphere of our private experience, and this sphere, as we have seen, is exceedingly limited. The question we have now to consider is whether such an extension is possible, and if so, how it is effected. Let us take as an illustration a matter about which none of us, in fact, feel the slightest doubt. We are all convinced that the sun will rise tomorrow. Why? Is this belief a mere blind outcome of past experience, or can it be justified as a reasonable belief? It is not easy to find a test by which to judge whether a belief of this kind is reasonable or not, but we can at least ascertain what sort of general beliefs would suffice, if true, to justify the judgment that the sun will rise tomorrow and the many other similar judgments upon which our actions are based. It is obvious that if we are asked why we believe that the sun will rise tomorrow, we shall naturally answer, because it always has risen every day. We have a firm belief that it will rise in the future, because it has risen in the past. If we are challenged as to why we believe that it will continue to rise, as heretofore, we may appeal to the laws of motion, the earth, we shall say, is a freely rotating body, and such bodies do not cease to rotate unless something interferes from outside, and there is nothing outside to interfere with the earth between now and tomorrow. Of course, it might be doubted whether we are quite certain that there is nothing outside to interfere, but this is not the interesting doubt. The interesting doubt is as to whether the laws of motion will remain in operation until tomorrow. If this doubt is raised, we find ourselves in the same position as when the doubt about the sunrise was first raised. The only reason for believing that the laws of motion will remain in operation is that they have operated hitherto, so far as our knowledge of the past enables us to judge. It is true that we have a greater body of evidence from the past in favor of the laws of motion than we have in favor of the sunrise because the sunrise is merely a particular case of fulfillment of the laws of motion, and there are countless other particular cases. But the real question is, do any number of cases of a law being fulfilled in the past afford evidence that it will be fulfilled in the future? If not, it becomes plain that we have no ground whatever for expecting the sun to rise tomorrow, or for expecting the bread we shall eat at our next meal not to poison us, or for any of the other scarcely conscious expectations that control our daily lives. 
it is to be observed that all such expectations are only probable. Thus, we have not to seek for proof that they must be fulfilled, but only for some reason in favor of the view that they are likely to be filled. Now, in dealing with this question, we must, to begin with, make an important distinction, without which we should soon become involved in hopeless confusions. Experience has shown us that, hitherto, the frequent repetition of some uniform succession or coexistence has been a cause of our expecting the same succession or coexistence on the next occasion. Food that has a certain appearance generally has a certain taste, and it is a severe shock to our expectations when the familiar appearance is found to be associated with an unusual taste. Things which we see become associated by habit with certain tactile sensations which we expect if we touch them. One of the horrors of a ghost, in many ghost stories, is that it fails to give us any sensations of touch. Uneducated people who go abroad for the first time are so surprised as to be incredulous when they find their native language not understood. And this kind of association is not confined to men. In animals, also, it is very strong. A horse which has been often driven along a certain road resists the attempt to drive him in a different direction. Domestic animals expect food when they see the person who usually feeds them. We know that all these rather crude expectations of uniformity are liable to be misleading. The man who has fed the chicken every day throughout its life at last wrings its neck instead, showing that more refined views as to the uniformity of nature would have been useful to the chicken. But in spite of the misleadingness of such expectations, they nevertheless exist. The mere fact that something has happened a certain number of times causes animals and men to expect that it will happen again. Thus, our instincts certainly cause us to believe that the sun will rise tomorrow. But we may be in no better a position than the chicken which unexpectedly has its neck wrung. We have, therefore, to distinguish the fact that past uniformities caused expectations as to the future from the question whether there is any reasonable ground for giving weight to such expectations after the question of their validity has been raised. The problem we have to discuss is whether there is any reason for believing in what is called the uniformity of nature. The belief in the uniformity of nature is the belief that everything that has happened or will happen is an instance of some general law to which there are no exceptions. The crude expectations which we have been considering are all subject to exceptions and therefore liable to disappoint those who entertain them. But science habitually assumes, at least as a working hypothesis, that general rules which have exceptions can be replaced by general rules which have no exceptions. Unsupported bodies in air fall is a general rule to which balloons and aeroplanes are exceptions. But the laws of motion and the law of gravitation, which account for the fact that most bodies fall, also account for the fact that balloons and aeroplanes can rise. Thus the laws of motion and the law of gravitation are not subject to these exceptions. The belief that the sun will rise tomorrow might be falsified if the earth came suddenly into contact with a large body which destroyed its rotation. But the laws of motion and the law of gravitation would not be infringed by such an event. The business of science is to find uniformities, such as the laws of motion and the law of gravitation, to which, so far as our experience extends, there are no exceptions. In this search, science has been remarkably successful, and it may be conceded that such uniformities have held hitherto. This brings us back to the question, have we any reason, assuming that they have always held in the past, to suppose that they will hold in the future? It has been argued that we have reason to know that the future will resemble the past, because what was the future has constantly become the past, and has always been found to resemble the past, so that we really have experience of the future, namely of times which were formerly future, which we may call past futures. 
but such an argument really begs the very question at issue. We have experience of past futures, but not of future futures, and the question is, will future futures resemble past futures? This question is not to be answered by an argument which starts from past futures alone. We have, therefore, still to seek for some principle which shall enable us to know that the future will follow the same laws as the past. The reference to the future in this question is not essential. The same question arises when we apply the laws that work in our experience to past things of which we have no experience, as, for example, in geology, or in theories as to the origin of the solar system. The question we really have to ask is, when two things have been found to be often associated, and no instance is known of the one occurring without the other, does the occurrence of one of the two in a fresh instance give any ground for expecting the other? On our answer to this question must depend the validity of the whole of our expectations as to the future, and the whole of the results obtained by induction, and in fact practically all the beliefs upon which our daily life is based. It must be conceded, to begin with, that the fact that two things have been found often together and never apart does not by itself suffice to prove demonstratively that they will be found together in the next case we examine. The most we can hope is that the oftener things are found together, the more probable it becomes that they will be found together another time, and that, if they have been found together often enough, the probability will amount almost to certainty. It can never quite reach certainty, because we know that, in spite of frequent repetitions, there sometimes is a failure at the last, as in the case of the chicken whose neck is wrung. Thus, probability is all we ought to seek. It might be urged, as against the view we are advocating, that we know all natural phenomena to be subject to the reign of law, and that sometimes, on the basis of observation, we can see that only one law can possibly fit the facts of the case. Now to this view there are two answers. The first is that, even if some law, which has no exceptions, applies to our case, we can never, in practice, be sure that we have discovered that law, and not one to which there are exceptions. The second is that the reign of law would seem to be itself only probable, and that our belief that it will hold in the future, or in unexamined cases in the past, is itself based upon the very principle we are examining. The principle we are examining may be called the principle of induction, and its two parts may be stated as follows. A. When a thing of a certain sort A has been found to be associated with a thing of a certain other sort B, and has never been found dissociated from a thing of the sort B, the greater the number of cases in which A and B have been associated, the greater is the probability that they will be associated in a fresh case in which one of them is known to be present. B. Under the same circumstances, a sufficient number of cases of association will make the probability of a fresh association nearly a certainty, and will make it approach certainty without limit. As just stated, the principle applies only to the verification of our expectation in a single fresh instance, but we want also to know that there is a probability in favor of the general law that things of the sort A are always associated with things of the sort B provided a sufficient number of cases of association are known, and no cases of failure of association are known. The probability of the general law is obviously less than the probability of the particular case, since if the general law is true, the particular case must also be true, whereas the particular case may be true without the general law being true. Nevertheless, the probability of the general law is increased by repetitions, just as the probability of the particular case is. We may therefore repeat the two parts of our principle as regards the general law. Thus, a. 
the greater the number of cases in which a thing of the sort a has been found associated with a thing of the sort b the more probable it is if no cases of failure of association are known that a is always associated with b b under the same circumstances a sufficient number of cases of the association of a with b will make it nearly certain that a is always associated with b and will make this general law approach certainty without limit it should be noted that probability is always relative to certain data in our case the data are merely the known cases of coexistence of a and b there may be other data which might be taken into account which would gravely alter the probability for example a man who had seen a great many white swans might argue by our principle that on the data it was probable that all swans were white and this might be a perfectly sound argument the argument is not disproved by the fact that some swans are black because a thing may very well happen in spite of the fact that some data render it improbable in the case of the swans a man might know that color is a very variable characteristic in many species of animals and that therefore an induction as to color is peculiarly liable to error but this knowledge would be a fresh datum by no means proving that the probability relatively to our previous data had been wrongly estimated the fact therefore that things often fail to fulfill our expectations is no evidence that our expectations will not probably be fulfilled in a given case or a given class of cases thus our inductive principle is at any rate not capable of being disproved by an appeal to experience the inductive principle however is equally incapable of being proved by an appeal to experience experience might conceivably confirm the inductive principle as regards the cases that have been already examined but as regards unexamined cases it is the inductive principle alone that can justify any inference from what has been examined to what has not been examined all arguments which on the basis of experience argue as to the future or the unexperienced parts of the past or present assume the inductive principle hence we can never use experience to prove the inductive principle without begging the question thus we must either accept the inductive principle on the ground of its intrinsic evidence or forego all justification of our expectations about the future if the principle is unsound we have no reason to expect the sun to rise tomorrow to expect bread to be more nourishing than a stone or to expect that if we throw ourselves off the roof we shall fall when we see what looks like our best friend approaching us we shall have no reason to suppose that his body is not inhabited by the mind of our worst enemy or of some total stranger all our conduct is based upon associations which have worked in the past and which we therefore regard as likely to work in the future and this likelihood is dependent for its validity upon the inductive principle the general principles of science such as the belief in the reign of law and the belief that every event must have a cause are as completely dependent upon the inductive principle as are the beliefs of daily life all such general principles are believed because mankind have found innumerable instances of their truth and no instances of their falsehood but this affords no evidence for their truth in the future unless the inductive principle is assumed thus all knowledge which on a basis of experience tells us something about what is not experienced is based upon a belief which experience can neither confirm nor confute yet which at least in its more concrete applications appears to be as firmly rooted in us as many of the facts of experience the existence and justification of such beliefs for the inductive principle as we shall see is not the only example raises some of the most difficult and most debated problems of philosophy we will in the next chapter 
consider briefly what may be said to account for such knowledge and what is its scope and its degree of certainty end of chapter six chapter seven of the problems of philosophy by bertrand russell this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by landon dc elkind at the university of iowa in coralville iowa recorded at the bertrand russell archives at mcmaster university in hamilton ontario chapter seven on our knowledge of general principles we saw in the preceding chapter that the principle of induction while necessary to the validity of all arguments based on experience is itself not capable of being proved by experience and yet is unhesitatingly believed by everyone at least in all its concrete applications in these characteristics the principle of induction does not stand alone there are a number of other principles which cannot be proved or disproved by experience but are used in arguments which start from what is experienced some of these principles have even greater evidence than the principle of induction and the knowledge of them has the same degree of certainty as the knowledge of the existence of sense data they constitute the means of drawing inferences from what is given in sensation and if what we infer is to be true it is just as necessary that our principles of inference should be true as it is that our data should be true the principles of inference are apt to be overlooked because of their very obviousness the assumption involved is assented to without our realizing that it is an assumption but it is very important to realize the use of principles of inference if a correct theory of knowledge is to be obtained for our knowledge of them raises interesting and difficult questions in all our knowledge of general principles what actually happens is that first of all we realize some particular application of the principle and then we realize that the particularity is irrelevant and that there is a generality which may equally truly be affirmed this is of course familiar in such matters as teaching arithmetic two and two are four is first learnt in the case of some particular pair of couples and then in some other particular case and so on until at last it becomes possible to see that it is true of any pair of couples the same thing happens with logical principles suppose two men are discussing what day of the month it is one of them says at least you will admit that if yesterday was the fifteenth today must be the sixteenth yes says the other i admit that and you know the first continues that yesterday was the fifteenth because you dined with jones and your diary will tell you that was on the fifteenth yes says the second therefore today is the sixteenth now such an argument is not hard to follow and if it is granted that its premises are true in fact no one will deny that the conclusion must also be true but it depends for its truth upon an instance of a general logical principle the logical principle is as follows suppose it known that if this is true then that is true suppose it also known that this is true then it follows that that is true when it is the case that if this is true that is true we shall say that this implies that and that that follows from this thus our principle states that if this implies that and this is true then that is true in other words anything implied by a true proposition is true or whatever follows from a true proposition is true this principle is really involved at least concrete instances of it are involved in all demonstrations whenever one thing which we believe is used to prove something else 
which we consequently believe, this principle is relevant. If anyone asks, why should I accept the results of valid arguments based on true premises, we can only answer by appealing to our principle. In fact, the truth of the principle is impossible to doubt, and its obviousness is so great that at first sight it seems almost trivial. Such principles, however, are not trivial to the philosopher, for they show that we may have indubitable knowledge which is in no way derived from objects of sense. The above principle is merely one of a certain number of self-evident logical principles. Some at least of these principles must be granted before any argument or proof becomes possible. When some of them have been granted, others can be proved, though these others, so long as they are simple, are just as obvious as the principles taken for granted. For no very good reason, three of these principles have been singled out by tradition under the name of laws of thought. They are as follows. 1. The law of identity. Whatever is, is. 2. The law of contradiction. Nothing can both be and not be. 3. The law of excluded middle. Everything must either be or not be. These three laws are samples of self-evident logical principles, but are not really more fundamental or more self-evident than various other similar principles. For instance, the one we considered just now, which states that what follows from a true premise is true. The name laws of thought is also misleading, for what is important is not the fact that we think in accordance with these laws, but the fact that things behave in accordance with them. In other words, the fact that when we think in accordance with them, we think truly. But this is a large question, to which we must return at a later stage. In addition to the logical principles which enable us to prove from a given premise that something is certainly true, there are other logical principles which enable us to prove from a given premise that there is a greater or less probability that something is true. An example of such principles, perhaps the most important example, is the inductive principle, which we considered in the preceding chapter. One of the great historic controversies in philosophy is the controversy between the two schools called, respectively, empiricists and rationalists. The empiricists, who are best represented by the British philosophers Locke, Berkeley, and Hume, maintained that all our knowledge is derived from experience. The rationalists, who are represented by the continental philosophers of the 17th century, especially Descartes and Leibniz, maintained that, in addition to what we know by experience, there are certain innate ideas or innate principles which we know independently of experience. It has now become possible to decide with some confidence as to the truth or falsehood of these opposing schools. It must be admitted, for the reasons already stated, that logical principles are known to us and cannot be themselves proved by experience, since all proof presupposes them. In this, therefore, which was the most important point of the controversy, the rationalists were in the right. On the other hand, even that part of our knowledge which is logically independent of experience, in the sense that experience cannot prove it, is yet elicited and caused by experience. It is on occasion of particular experiences that we become aware of the general laws which their connections exemplify. It would certainly be absurd to suppose that there are innate principles in the sense that babies are born with a knowledge of everything which men know and which cannot be deduced from what is experienced. For this reason, the word innate would not now be employed to describe our knowledge of logical principles. The phrase a priori is less objectionable and is more usual in modern writers. Thus, while admitting that all knowledge is elicited and caused by experience, we shall nevertheless hold that some knowledge is a priori in the sense that the experience which makes us think of it 
does not suffice to prove it, but merely so directs our attention that we see its truth without requiring any proof from experience. There is another point of great importance in which the empiricists were in the right as against the rationalists. Nothing can be known to exist except by the help of experience. That is to say, if we wish to prove that something of which we have no direct experience exists, we must have among our premises the existence of one or more things of which we have direct experience. Our belief that the emperor of China exists, for example, rests upon testimony, and testimony consists, in the last analysis, of sense data seen or heard in reading or being spoken to. Rationalists believed that, from general consideration as to what must be, they could deduce the existence of this or that in the actual world. In this belief, they seem to have been mistaken. All the knowledge that we can acquire a priori concerning existence seems to be hypothetical. It tells us that if one thing exists, another must exist, or more generally, that if one proposition is true, another must be true. This is exemplified by the principles we have dealt with, such as if this is true and this implies that, then that is true, or if this and that have been repeatedly found connected, they will probably be connected in the next instance in which one of them is found. Thus, the scope and power of a priori principles is strictly limited. All knowledge that something exists must be in part dependent on experience. When anything is known immediately, its existence is known by experience alone. When anything is proved to exist without being known immediately, both experience and a priori principles must be required in the proof. Knowledge is called empirical when it rests wholly or partly upon experience. Thus, all knowledge which asserts existence is empirical, and the only a priori knowledge concerning existence is hypothetical. Giving connections among things that exist or may exist but not giving actual existence. A priori knowledge is not all of the logical kind we have been hitherto considering. Perhaps the most important example of non-logical a priori knowledge is knowledge as to ethical value. I am not speaking of judgments as to what is useful or as to what is virtuous, for such judgments do require empirical premises. I am speaking of judgments as to the intrinsic desirability of things. If something is useful, it must be useful because it secures some end. The end must, if we have gone far enough, be valuable on its own account, and not merely because it is useful for some further end. Thus, all judgments as to what is useful depend upon judgments as to what has value on its own account. We judge, for example, that happiness is more desirable than misery, knowledge than ignorance, goodwill than hatred, and so on. Such judgments must, in part at least, be immediate and a priori. Like our previous a priori judgments, they may be elicited by experience, and indeed they must be, for it seems not possible to judge whether anything is intrinsically valuable unless we have experienced something of the same kind. But it is fairly obvious that they cannot be proved by experience, for the fact that a thing exists or does not exist cannot prove either that it is good, that it should exist, or that it is bad. The pursuit of this subject belongs to ethics, for the impossibility of deducing what ought to be from what is has to be established. In the present connection, it is only important to realize that knowledge as to what is intrinsically of value is a priori in the same sense in which logic is a priori, namely in the sense that the truth of such knowledge can be neither proved nor disproved by experience. All pure mathematics is a priori, like logic. This was strenuously denied by the empirical philosophers, 
who maintained that experience was as much the source of our knowledge of arithmetic as are of our knowledge of geography they maintained that by the repeated experience of seeing two things and two other things and finding that altogether they made four things we were led by induction to the conclusion that two things and two other things would always make four things altogether if however this were the source of our knowledge that two and two are four we should proceed differently in persuading ourselves of its truth from the way in which we do actually proceed in fact a certain number of instances are needed to make us think of two abstractly rather than of two coins or two books or two people or two of any other specified kind but as soon as we are able to divest our thoughts of irrelevant particularity we become able to see the general principle that two and two are four any one instance is seen to be typical and the examination of other instances becomes unnecessary footnote one confer alfred north whitehead introduction to mathematics home university library end of footnote one the same thing is exemplified in geometry if we want to prove some property of all triangles we draw some one triangle and reason about it but we can avoid making use of any property which it does not share with all other triangles and thus from our particular case we obtain a general result we do not in fact feel our certainty that two and two are four increased by fresh instances because as soon as we have seen the truth of this proposition our certainty becomes so great as to be incapable of growing greater moreover we feel some quality of necessity about the proposition two and two are four which is absent from even the best attested empirical generalizations such generalizations always remain mere facts we feel that there might be a world in which they were false though in the actual world they happened to be true in any possible world on the contrary we feel that two and two would be four this is not a mere fact but a necessity to which everything actual and possible must conform the case may be made clearer by considering a genuinely empirical generalization such as all men are mortal it is plain that we believe this proposition in the first place because there is no known instance of men living beyond a certain age and in the second place because there seem to be physiological grounds for thinking that an organism such as a man's body must sooner or later wear out neglecting the second ground and considering merely our experience of men's mortality it is plain that we should not be content with one quite clearly understood instance of a man dying whereas in the case of two and two are four one instance does suffice when carefully considered to persuade us that the same must happen in any other instance also we can be forced to admit on reflection that there may be some doubt however slight as to whether all men are mortal this may be made plain by the attempt to imagine two different worlds in one of which there are men who are not mortal while in the other two and two make five when swift invites us to consider the race of strolled bugs who never die we are able to acquiesce in imagination but a world where two and two make five seems quite on a different level we feel that such a world if there were one would upset the whole fabric of our knowledge and reduce us to utter doubt the fact is that in simple mathematical judgments such as two and two or four and also in many judgments of logic we can know the general proposition without inferring it from instances although some instance is usually necessary to make clear to us what the general proposition means this is why there is real utility in the process of deduction which goes from the general to the general or from the general to the particular 
as well as in the process of induction which goes from the particular to the particular or from the particular to the general it is an old debate among philosophers whether deduction ever gives new knowledge we can now see that in certain cases at least it does do so if we already know that two and two always make four and we know that brown and jones are two and so are robinson and smith we can deduce that brown and jones and robinson and smith are four this is new knowledge not contained in our premises because the general proposition two and two are four never told us there were such people as brown and jones and robinson and smith and the particular premises do not tell us that there were four of them whereas the particular proposition deduced does tell us both these things but the newness of the knowledge is much less certain if we take the stock instance of deduction that is always given in books on logic namely all men are mortal socrates is a man therefore socrates is mortal in this case what we really know beyond reasonable doubt is that certain men a b c were mortal since in fact they have died if socrates is one of these men it is foolish to go the roundabout way through all men are mortal to arrive at the conclusion that probably socrates is mortal if socrates is not one of the men on whom our induction is based we shall still do better to argue straight from our a b c to socrates than to go round by the general proposition all men are mortal for the probability that socrates is mortal is greater on our data than the probability that all men are mortal this is obvious because if all men are mortal so is socrates but if socrates is mortal it does not follow that all men are mortal hence we shall reach the conclusion that socrates is mortal with a greater approach to certainty if we make our argument purely inductive than if we go by way of all men are mortal and then use deduction this illustrates the difference between general propositions known a priori such as two and two are four and empirical generalizations such as all men are mortal in regard to the former deduction is the right mode of argument whereas in regard to the latter induction is always theoretically preferable and warrants a greater confidence in the truth of our conclusion because all empirical generalizations are more uncertain than the instances of them we have now seen that there are propositions known a priori and that among them are the propositions of logic and pure mathematics as well as the fundamental propositions of ethics the question which must next occupy us is this how is it possible that there should be such knowledge and more particularly how can there be knowledge of general propositions in cases where we have not examined all the instances and indeed never can examine them all because their number is infinite these questions which were first brought prominently forward by the german philosopher kant 1724 to 1804 are very difficult and historically very important end of chapter seven chapter eight of the problems of philosophy by bertrand russell this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by landon dc elkind at the university of iowa in coralville iowa recorded at the bertrand russell archives and McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario. Chapter 8 How a priori knowledge is possible. Immanuel Kant is generally regarded as the greatest of the modern philosophers. 
Though he lived through the Seven Years' War and the French Revolution, he never interrupted his teaching of philosophy at Konigsberg in East Prussia. His most distinctive contribution was the invention of what he called the critical philosophy, which, assuming as a datum that there is knowledge of various kinds, inquired how such knowledge comes to be possible, and deduced, from the answer to this inquiry, many metaphysical results as to the nature of the world. Whether these results were valid may well be doubted, but Kant undoubtedly deserves credit for two things. First, for having perceived that we have a priori knowledge, which is not purely analytic, that is, such that the opposite would be self-contradictory. And secondly, for having made evident the philosophical importance of the theory of knowledge. Before the time of Kant, it was generally held that whatever knowledge was a priori must be analytic. What this word means will be best illustrated by examples. If I say a bald man is a man, a plain figure is a figure, a bad poet is a poet, I make a purely analytic judgment. The subject spoken about is given as having at least two properties, of which one is singled out to be asserted of it. Such propositions as the above are trivial, and would never be enunciated in real life except by an orator preparing the way for a piece of sophistry. They are called analytic because the predicate is obtained by merely analyzing the subject. Before the time of Kant, it was thought that all judgments of which we could be certain a priori were of this kind, that in all of them there was a predicate which was only part of the subject of which it was asserted. If this were so, we should be involved in a definite contradiction if we attempted to deny anything that could be known a priori. A bald man is not bald, would assert and deny baldness of the same man, and would therefore contradict itself. Thus, according to the philosophers before Kant, the law of contradiction, which asserts that nothing can at the same time have and not have a certain property, suffice to establish the truth of all a priori knowledge. Hume, 1711-1776, who preceded Kant, accepting the usual view as to what makes knowledge a priori, discovered that, in many cases which had previously been supposed analytic, and notably in the case of cause and effect, the connection was really synthetic. Before Hume, rationalists at least had supposed that the effect could be logically deduced from the cause, if only we had sufficient knowledge. Hume argued, correctly, as would now be generally admitted, that this could not be done. Hence he inferred the far more doubtful proposition that nothing could be known a priori about the connection of cause and effect. Kant, who had been educated in the rationalist tradition, was much perturbed by Hume's skepticism and endeavored to find an answer to it. He perceived that not only the connection of cause and effect, but all the propositions of arithmetic and geometry are synthetic, that is, not analytic. In all these propositions, no analysis of the subject will reveal the predicate. His stock instance was the proposition, the sum of 7 and 5 is equal to 12. He pointed out quite truly that 7 and 5 have to be put together to give 12. The idea of 12 is not contained in them, nor even the idea of adding them together. Thus he was led to the conclusion that all pure mathematics, though a priori, is synthetic. And this conclusion raised a new problem of which he endeavored to find the solution. The question which Kant put at the beginning of his philosophy, namely, how is pure mathematics possible, is an interesting and difficult one, to which every philosophy which is not purely skeptical must find some answer. The answer of the pure empiricists, that our mathematical knowledge is derived by induction from particular instances, we have already seen to be inadequate, for two reasons. First, 
that the validity of the inductive principle itself cannot be proved by induction. Second, that the general propositions of mathematics, such as two and two always make four, can obviously be known with certainty by consideration of a single instance, and gain nothing by enumeration of other cases in which they have been found to be true. Thus, our knowledge of the general propositions of mathematics, and the same applies to logic, must be accounted for otherwise than our merely probable knowledge of empirical generalizations, such as all men are mortal. The problem arises through the fact that such knowledge is general, whereas all experience is particular. It seems strange that we should apparently be able to know some truths in advance about particular things of which we have as yet no experience. But it cannot easily be doubted that logic and arithmetic will apply to such things. We do not know who will be the inhabitants of London a hundred years hence, but we know that any two of them, and any other two of them, will make four of them. This apparent power of anticipating facts about things of which we have no experience is certainly surprising. Kant's solution of the problem, though not valid in my opinion, is interesting. It is, however, very difficult, and is differently understood by different philosophers. We can, therefore, only give the merest outline of it, and even that will be thought misleading by many exponents of Kant's system. What Kant maintained was that in all our experience, there are two elements to be distinguished, the one due to the object, that is, to what we have called the physical object, the other due to our own nature. We saw in discussing matter and sense data that the physical object is different from the associated sense data, and that the sense data are to be regarded as resulting from an interaction between the physical object and ourselves. So far we are in agreement with Kant, but what is distinctive of Kant is the way in which he apportions the shares of ourselves and the physical object respectively. He considers that the crude material given in sensation, the color, hardness, and so on, is due to the object, and that what we supply is the arrangement in space and time, and all the relations between sense data which result from comparison or from considering one as the cause of the other, or in any other way. His chief reason in favor of this view is that we seem to have a priori knowledge as to space and time, and causality, and comparison, but not as to the actual crude material of sensation. We can be sure, he says, that anything we shall ever experience must show the characteristics affirmed of it in our a priori knowledge, because these characteristics are due to our own nature, and therefore nothing can ever come into our experience without acquiring these characteristics. The physical object, which he calls the thing in itself, footnote, Kant's thing in itself is identical in definition with the physical object, namely, it is the cause of sensation. In the properties deduced from the definition, it is not identical, since Kant held, in spite of some inconsistency as regards cause, that we can know that none of the categories are applicable to the thing in itself. End of footnote. He regards as essentially unknowable. What can be known is the object as we have it in experience, which he calls the phenomenon. The phenomenon, being a joint product of us and the thing in itself, is sure to have those characteristics which are due to us, and is therefore sure to conform to our a priori knowledge. Hence this knowledge, though true of all actual and possible experience, must not be supposed to apply outside experience. Thus, in spite of the existence of a priori knowledge, we cannot know anything about the thing in itself, or about what is not an actual or possible object of experience. 
In this way, he tries to reconcile and harmonize the contentions of the rationalists with the arguments of the empiricists. Apart from minor grounds on which Kant's philosophy may be criticized, there is one main objection, which seems fatal to any attempt to deal with the problem of a priori knowledge by his method. The thing to be accounted for is our certainty that the facts must always conform to logic and arithmetic. To say that logic and arithmetic are contributed by us does not account for this. Our nature is as much a fact of the existing world as anything, and there can be no certainty that it will remain constant. It might happen, if Kant is right, that tomorrow our nature would so change as to make two and two become five. This possibility never seems to have occurred to him, yet it is one which utterly destroys the certainty and universality which he is anxious to vindicate for arithmetical propositions. It is true that this possibility, formally, is inconsistent with the Kantian view that time itself is a form imposed by the subject upon phenomena, so that our real self is not in time and has no tomorrow. But he will still have to suppose that the time order of phenomena is determined by characteristics of what is behind phenomena, and this suffices for the substance of our argument. Reflection, moreover, seems to make it clear that, if there is any truth in our arithmetical beliefs, they must apply to things equally whether we think of them or not. Two physical objects and two other physical objects must make four physical objects, even if physical objects cannot be experienced. To assert this is certainly within the scope of what we mean when we state that two and two are four. Its truth is just as indubitable as the truth of the assertion that two phenomena and two other phenomena make four phenomena. Thus, Kant's solution unduly limits the scope of a priori propositions, in addition to failing in the attempt at explaining their certainty. Apart from the special doctrines advocated by Kant, it is very common among philosophers to regard what is a priori as in some sense mental, as concerned rather with the way we must think than with any fact of the outer world. We noted in the preceding chapter the three principles commonly called laws of thought. The view which led to their being so named is a natural one, but there are strong reasons for thinking that it is erroneous. Let us take as an illustration the law of contradiction. This is commonly stated in the form, nothing can both be and not be, which is intended to express the fact that nothing can at once have and not have a given quality. Thus, for example, if a tree is a beech, it cannot also be not a beech. If my table is rectangular, it cannot also be not rectangular, and so on. Now, what makes it natural to call this principle a law of thought is that it is by thought rather than by outward observation that we persuade ourselves of its necessary truth. When we have seen that a tree is a beech, we do not need to look again in order to ascertain whether it is also not a beech. Thought alone makes us know that this is impossible. But the conclusion that the law of contradiction is a law of thought is nevertheless erroneous. What we believe when we believe the law of contradiction is not that the mind is so made that it must believe the law of contradiction. This belief is a subsequent result of psychological reflection, which presupposes the belief in the law of contradiction. The belief in the law of contradiction is a belief about things, not only about thoughts. It is not, for example, the belief that if we think a certain tree is a beech, we cannot at the same time think that it is not a beech. It is the belief that if the tree is a beech, it cannot at the same time be not a beech. Thus, the law of contradiction is about things and not merely about thoughts, 
and although belief in the law of contradiction is a thought, the law of contradiction itself is not a thought, but a fact concerning the things in the world. If this, which we believe when we believe the law of contradiction, were not true of the things in the world, the fact that we were compelled to think it true would not save the law of contradiction from being false, and this shows that the law is not a law of thought. A similar argument applies to any other a priori judgment. When we judge that two and two are four, we are not making a judgment about our thoughts, but about all actual or possible couples. The fact that our minds are so constituted as to believe that two and two are four, though it is true, is emphatically not what we assert when we assert that two and two are four. And no fact about the constitution of our minds could make it true that two and two are four. Thus, our a priori knowledge, if it is not erroneous, is not merely knowledge about the constitution of our minds, but is applicable to whatever the world may contain, both what is mental and what is non-mental. The fact seems to be that all our a priori knowledge is concerned with entities which do not, properly speaking, exist, either in the mental or in the physical world. These entities are such as can be named by parts of speech which are not substantives. They are such entities as qualities and relations. Suppose, for instance, that I am in my room. I exist and my room exists, but does in exist? Yet obviously the word in has a meaning. It denotes a relation which holds between me and my room. This relation is something, although we cannot say that it exists in the same sense in which I and my room exist. The relation in is something which we can think about and understand, for if we could not understand it, we could not understand the sentence, I am in my room. Many philosophers following Kant have maintained that relations are the work of the mind, that things in themselves have no relations, but that the mind brings them together in one act of thought, and thus produces the relations which it judges them to have. This view, however, seems open to objections similar to those we urged before against Kant. It seems plain that it is not thought which produces the truth of the proposition, I'm in my room. It may be that an earwig is in my room, even if neither I nor the earwig, nor anyone else, is aware of this truth. For this truth concerns only the earwig and the room, and does not depend upon anything else. Thus, relations, as we shall see more fully in the next chapter, must be placed in a world which is neither mental nor physical. This world is of great importance to philosophy, and in particular to the problems of a priori knowledge. In the next chapter, we shall proceed to develop its nature and its bearing upon the questions with which we have been dealing. End of chapter 8「Chapter Nine of the Problems of Philosophy by Bertrand Russell. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Landon D. C. Elkind at the University of Iowa in Coralville, Iowa. Recorded at the Bertrand Russell Archives at McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario. Chapter 9. The World of Universals At the end of the preceding chapter, we saw that such entities as relations appear to have a being, which is in some way different from that of physical objects, and also different from that of minds and from that of sense data. In the present chapter, we have to consider what is the nature of this kind of being, and also what objects there are that have this kind of being. We will begin with the latter question. 
The problem with which we are now concerned is a very old one, since it was brought into philosophy by Plato. Plato's theory of ideas is an attempt to solve this very problem, and in my opinion, it is one of the most successful attempts hitherto made. The theory to be advocated in what follows is largely Plato's, with merely such modifications as time has shown to be necessary. The way the problem arose for Plato was more or less as follows. Let us consider, say, such a notion as justice. If we ask ourselves what justice is, it is natural to proceed by considering this, that, and the other just act, with a view to discovering what they have in common. They must all, in some sense, partake of a common nature, which will be found in whatever is just, and in nothing else. This common nature, in virtue of which they are all just, will be justice itself. The pure essence, the admixture of which, with facts of ordinary life, produces the multiplicity of just acts. Similarly with any other word which may be applicable to common facts, such as whiteness, for example. The word will be applicable to a number of particular things, because they all participate in a common nature or essence. This pure essence is what Plato calls an idea or form. It must not be supposed that ideas, in his sense, exist in minds, though they may be apprehended by minds. The idea, justice, is not identical with anything that is just. It is something other than particular things, which particular things partake of. Not being particular, it cannot itself exist in the world of sense. Moreover, it is not fleeting or changeable, like the things of sense. It is eternally itself immutable and indestructible. Thus Plato is led to a suprasensible world, more real than the common world of sense, the unchangeable world of ideas, which alone gives to the world of sense whatever pale reflection of reality may belong to it. The truly real world, for Plato, is the world of ideas, for whatever we may attempt to say about things in the world of sense, we can only succeed in saying that they participate in such and such ideas, which, therefore, constitute all their character. Hence it is easy to pass on into a mysticism, we may hope, in a mystic illumination, to see the ideas, as we see objects of sense, and we may imagine that the ideas exist in heaven. These mystical developments are very natural, but the basis of the theory is in logic, and it is as based in logic that we have to consider it. The word idea has acquired, in the course of time, many associations which are quite misleading when applied to Plato's ideas. We shall therefore use the word universal instead of the word idea to describe what Plato meant. The essence of the sort of entity that Plato meant is that it is opposed to the particular things that are given in sensation. We speak of whatever is given in sensation, or is of the same nature as things given in sensation, as a particular. By opposition to this, a universal will be anything which may be shared by many particulars, and has those characteristics which, as we saw, distinguish justice and whiteness from just acts and white things. When we examine common words, we find that, broadly speaking, proper names stand for particulars while other substantives, adjectives, prepositions, and verbs stand for universals. Pronouns stand for particulars, but are ambiguous. It is only by the context or the circumstances that we know what particulars they stand for. The word now stands for a particular, namely the present moment. But like pronouns, it stands for an ambiguous particular, because the present is always changing. It will be seen that no sentence can be made up without at least one word which denotes a universal. The nearest approach would be some such statement as, I like this. 
but even here the word like denotes a universal for i may like other things and other people may like things thus all truths involve universals and all knowledge of truths involves acquaintance with universals seeing that nearly all the words to be found in the dictionary stand for universals it is strange that hardly anybody except students of philosophy ever realize that there are such entities as universals we do not naturally dwell upon those words in a sentence which do not stand for particulars and if we are forced to dwell upon a word which stands for a universal we naturally think of it as standing for some one of the particulars that comes under the universal when for example we hear the sentence charles i's head was cut off we may naturally enough think of charles i of charles i's head and of the operation of cutting off his head which are all particulars but we do not naturally dwell upon what is meant by the word head or the word cut which is a universal we feel such words to be incomplete and insubstantial they seem to demand a context before anything can be done with them hence we succeed in avoiding all notice of universals as such until the study of philosophy forces them upon our attention even among philosophers we may say broadly that only those universals which are named by adjectives or substantives have been much or often recognized while those named by verbs and prepositions have been usually overlooked this omission has had a very great effect upon philosophy it is hardly too much to say that most metaphysics since spinoza has been largely determined by it the way this has occurred is in outline as follows speaking generally adjectives and common nouns express qualities or properties of single things whereas prepositions and verbs tend to express relations between two or more things thus the neglect of prepositions and verbs led to the belief that every proposition can be regarded as attributing a property to a single thing rather than as expressing a relation between two or more things hence it was supposed that ultimately there can be no such entities as relations between things hence either there can be only one thing in the universe or if there are many things they cannot possibly interact in any way since any interaction would be a relation and relations are impossible the first of these views which was advocated by spinoza and is held in our own day by mr bradley and many other philosophers is called monism the second which was advocated by leibniz but is not very common nowadays is called monadism because each of the isolated things is called a monad but these opposing philosophies interesting as they are result in my opinion from an undue attention to one sort of universals namely the sort represented by adjectives and substantives rather than by verbs and prepositions as a matter of fact if anyone were anxious to deny altogether that there are such things as universals we should find that we cannot strictly prove that there are such entities as qualities that is the universals represented by adjectives and substantives whereas we can prove that there must be relations that is the sort of universals generally represented by verbs and prepositions let us take an illustration the universal whiteness if we believe that there is such a universal we shall say that things are white because they have the quality of whiteness this view however was strenuously denied by barclay and hume who have been followed in this by later empiricists the form which their denial took was to deny that there are such things as abstract ideas when we want to think of whiteness they said we form an image of some particular white thing and reason concerning this particular taking care not to deduce anything concerning it which we cannot see to be equally true 
of any other white thing. As an account of our actual mental processes, this is no doubt largely true. In geometry, for example, when we wish to prove something about all triangles, we draw a particular triangle and reason about it, taking care not to use any characteristic which it does not share with other triangles. The beginner, in order to avoid error, often finds it useful to draw several triangles, as unlike each other as possible, in order to make sure that his reasoning is equally applicable to all of them. But a difficulty emerges as soon as we ask ourselves how we know that a thing is white or a triangle. If we wish to avoid the universal's whiteness and triangularity, we shall choose some particular patch of white or some particular triangle and say that anything is white or a triangle if it has the right sort of resemblance to our chosen particular. But then the resemblance required will have to be a universal. Since there are many white things, the resemblance must hold between many pairs of particular white things. And this is the characteristic of a universal. It will be useless to say that there is a different resemblance for each pair, for then we shall have to say that these resemblances resemble each other, and thus at last we shall be forced to admit resemblance as a universal. The relation of resemblance, therefore, must be a true universal, and having been forced to admit this universal, we find that it is no longer worthwhile to invent difficult and unplausible theories to avoid the admission of such universals as whiteness and triangularity. Barclay and Hume failed to perceive this refutation of their rejection of abstract ideas because, like their adversaries, they only thought of qualities and altogether ignored relations as universals. We have therefore here another respect in which the rationalists appear to have been in the right as against the empiricists, although, owing to their neglect or denial of relations, the deductions made by rationalists were, if anything, more apt to be mistaken than those made by empiricists. Having now seen that there must be such entities as universals, the next point to be proved is that their being is not merely mental. By this is meant that whatever being belongs to them is independent of their being thought of, or in any way apprehended, by minds. We have already touched on this subject at the end of the preceding chapter, but we must now consider more fully what sort of being it is that belongs to universals. Consider such a proposition as Edinburgh is north of London, here we have a relation between two places, and it seems plain that the relation subsists independently of our knowledge of it. When we come to know that Edinburgh is north of London, we come to know something which has to do only with Edinburgh and London. We do not cause the truth of the proposition by coming to know it. On the contrary, we merely apprehend a fact which was there before we knew it. The part of the Earth's surface where Edinburgh stands would be north of the part where London stands, even if there were no human being to know about north and south, and even if there were no minds at all in the universe. This is, of course, denied by many philosophers, either for Barclay's reasons or for Kant's. But we have already considered these reasons and decided that they are inadequate. We may, therefore, now assume it to be true that nothing mental is presupposed in the fact that Edinburgh is north of London. But this fact involves the relation north of, which is a universal, and it would be impossible for the whole fact to involve nothing mental if the relation north of, which is a constituent part of the fact, did involve anything mental. Hence, we must admit that the relation, like the terms it relates, is not dependent upon thought, but belongs to the independent world, which thought apprehends but does not create. This conclusion, however, is met by the difficulty that the relation north of does not seem to exist 
in the same sense in which Edinburgh and London exist. If we ask, where and when does this relation exist? The answer must be, nowhere and no when. There is no place or time where we can find the relation north of. It does not exist in Edinburgh any more than in London, for it relates the two and is neutral as between them. Nor can we say that it exists at any particular time. Now everything that can be apprehended by the senses or by introspection exists at some particular time. Hence the relation north of is radically different from such things. It is neither in space nor in time, neither material nor mental. Yet it is something. It is largely the very peculiar kind of being that belongs to universals, which has led many people to suppose that they are really mental. We can think of a universal, and our thinking then exists in a perfectly ordinary sense, like any other mental act. Suppose, for example, that we are thinking of whiteness. Then, in one sense, it may be said that whiteness is in our mind. We have here the same ambiguity as we noted in discussing Barclay in Chapter 4. In the strict sense, it is not whiteness that is in our mind, but the act of thinking of whiteness. The connected ambiguity in the word idea, which we noted at the same time, also causes confusion here. In one sense of this word, namely the sense in which it denotes the object of an act of thought, whiteness is an idea. Hence, if the ambiguity is not guarded against, we may come to think that whiteness is an idea in the other sense, that is, an act of thought. And thus, we come to think that whiteness is mental. But in so thinking, we rob it of its essential quality of universality. One man's act of thought is necessarily a different thing from another man's. One man's act of thought at one time is necessarily a different thing from the same man's act of thought at another time. Hence, if whiteness were the thought as opposed to its object, no two different men could think of it, and no one man could think of it twice. That which many different thoughts of whiteness have in common is their object and this object is different from all of them. Thus, universals are not thoughts, though when known, they are the objects of thoughts. We shall find it convenient only to speak of things existing when they are in time, that is to say, when we can point to some time at which they exist, not excluding the possibility of their existing at all times. Thus, thoughts and feelings, minds and physical objects, exist, but universals do not exist in this sense. We shall say that they subsist, or have being, where being is opposed to existence as being timeless. The world of universals, therefore, may also be described as the world of being. The world of being is unchangeable, rigid, exact delightful to the mathematician, the logician, the builder of metaphysical systems, and all who love perfection more than life. The world of existence is fleeting, vague, without sharp boundaries, without any clear plan or arrangement, but it contains all thoughts and feelings, all the data of sense, and all physical objects, everything that can do either good or harm, everything that makes any difference to the value of life, and the world. According to our temperaments, we shall prefer the contemplation of the one or of the other. The one we do not prefer will probably seem to us a pale shadow of the one we prefer, and hardly worthy to be regarded as in any sense real. But the truth is that both have the same claim on our impartial attention. Both are real, and both are important to the metaphysician. Indeed, no sooner have we distinguished the two worlds than it becomes necessary to consider their relations. But first of all, we must examine our knowledge of universals. This consideration will occupy us in the following chapter, where we shall find that it solves the problem of a priori knowledge, from which we were first led to consider universals.
End of chapter 9「Chapter 10 of the Problems of Philosophy」by Bertrand Russell. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Landon D.C. Elkind at the University of Iowa in Coralville, Iowa. Recorded at the Bertrand Russell Archives at McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario. Chapter 10 on our knowledge of universals. In regard to one man's knowledge at a given time, universals, like particulars, may be divided into those known by acquaintance, those known only by description, and those not known either by acquaintance or by description. Let us consider first the knowledge of universals by acquaintance. It is obvious to begin with that we are acquainted with such universals as white, red, black, sweet, sour, loud, hard, and so on, that is, with qualities which are exemplified in sense data. When we see a white patch, we are acquainted in the first instance with the particular patch, but by seeing many white patches, we easily learn to abstract the whiteness which they all have in common and in learning to do this, we are learning to be acquainted with whiteness. A similar process will make us acquainted with any other universal of the same sort. Universals of this sort may be called sensible qualities. They can be apprehended with less effort of abstraction than any others, and they seem less removed from particulars than other universals are. We come next to relations. The easiest relations to apprehend are those which hold between the different parts of a single complex sense datum. For example, I can see at a glance the whole of the page on which I am writing. Thus, the whole page is included in one sense datum. But I perceive that some parts of the page are to the left of other parts, and some parts are above other parts. The process of abstraction in this case seems to proceed somewhat as follows. I see successively a number of sense data in which one part is to the left of another. I perceive, as in the case of different white patches, that all these sense data have something in common, and by abstraction I find that what they have in common is a certain relation between their parts, namely the relation which I call being to the left of. In this way, I become acquainted with the universal relation. In like manner, I become aware of the relation of before and after in time. Suppose I hear a chime of bells. When the last bell of the chime sounds, I can retain the whole chime before my mind, and I can perceive that the earlier bells came before the later ones. Also in memory, I perceive that what I am remembering came before the present time. From either of these sources, I can abstract the universal relation of before and after, just as I abstracted the universal relation being to the left of. Thus, time relations, like space relations, are among those with which we are acquainted. Another relation with which we become acquainted in much the same way is resemblance. If I see simultaneously two shades of green, I can see that they resemble each other. If I also see a shade of red at the same time, I can see that the two greens have more resemblance to each other than either has to the red. In this way, I become acquainted with the universal resemblance or similarity between universals as between particulars there are relations of which we may be immediately aware we have just seen that we can perceive that the resemblance between two shades of green is greater than the resemblance between a shade of red and a shade of green here we are dealing with a relation namely greater than 
between two relations. Our knowledge of such relations, though it requires more power of abstraction than is required for perceiving the qualities of sense data, appears to be equally immediate and, at least in some cases, equally indubitable. Thus, there is immediate knowledge concerning universals as well as concerning sense data. Returning now to the problem of a priori knowledge, which we left unsolved when we began the consideration of universals, we find ourselves in a position to deal with it in a much more satisfactory manner than was possible before. Let us revert to the proposition 2 and 2 are 4. It is fairly obvious, in view of what has been said, that this proposition states a relation between the universal 2 and the universal 4. This suggests a proposition which we shall now endeavor to establish, namely, all a priori knowledge deals exclusively with the relations of universals. This proposition is of great importance and goes a long way towards solving our previous difficulties concerning a priori knowledge. The only case in which it might seem, at first sight, as if our proposition were untrue, is the case in which an a priori proposition states that all of one class of particulars belong to some other class, or, what comes to the same thing, that all particulars having some one property also have some other. In this case, it might seem as though we were dealing with the particulars that have the property rather than with the property. The proposition 2 and 2 are 4 is really a case in point, for this may be stated in the form any two and any other two are four, or any collection formed of two twos is a collection of four. If we can show that such statements as this really deal only with universals, our proposition may be regarded as proved. One way of discovering what a proposition deals with is to ask ourselves what words we must understand in other words, what objects we must be acquainted with, in order to see what the proposition means. As soon as we see what the proposition means, even if we do not yet know whether it is true or false, it is evident that we must have acquaintance with whatever is really dealt with by the proposition. By applying this test, it appears that many proposition, which might seem to be concerned with particulars, are really concerned only with universals. In the particular case of 2 and 2 are 4, even when we interpret it as meaning any collection formed of two twos is a collection of 4, it is plain that we can understand the proposition, that is, we can see what it is that it asserts, as soon as we know what is meant by collection and 2 and 4. It is quite unnecessary to know all the couples in the world. If it were necessary, obviously we could never understand the proposition, since the couples are infinitely numerous and therefore cannot all be known to us. Thus, although our general statement implies statements about particular couples, as soon as we know that there are such particular couples, yet it does not itself assert or imply that there are such particular couples, and thus fails to make any statement whatever about any particular couple. The statement made is about couple, the universal, and not about this or that couple. Thus, the statement 2 and 2 are 4 deals exclusively with universals, and therefore may be known by anybody who is acquainted with the universals concerned and can perceive the relation between them which the statement asserts. It must be taken as a fact, discovered by reflecting upon our knowledge, that we have the power of sometimes perceiving such relations between universals, and therefore of sometimes knowing general a priori propositions such as those of arithmetic and logic. 
the thing that seemed mysterious when we formerly considered such knowledge was that it seemed to anticipate and control experience this however we can now see to have been an error no fact concerning anything capable of being experienced can be known independently of experience we know a priori that two things and two other things together make four things but we do not know a priori that if brown and jones are two and robinson and smith are two then brown and jones and robinson and smith are four the reason is that this proposition cannot be understood at all unless we know that there are such people as brown and jones and robinson and smith and this we can only know by experience hence although our general proposition is a priori all its applications to actual particulars involve experience and therefore contain an empirical element in this way what seemed mysterious in our a priori knowledge is seen to have been based upon an error it will serve to make the point clearer if we contrast our genuine a priori judgment with an empirical generalization such as all men are mortals here as before we can understand what the proposition means as soon as we understand the universals involved namely man and mortal it is obviously unnecessary to have an individual acquaintance with the whole human race in order to understand what our proposition means thus the difference between an a priori general proposition and an empirical generalization does not come in the meaning of the proposition it comes in the nature of the evidence for it in the empirical case the evidence consists in the particular instances we believe that all men are mortal because we know that there are innumerable instances of men dying and no instances of their living beyond a certain age we do not believe it because we see a connection between the universal man and the universal mortal it is true that if physiology can prove assuming the general laws that govern living bodies that no living organism can last forever that gives a connection between man and mortality which would enable us to assert our proposition without appealing to the special evidence of men dying but that only means that our generalization has been subsumed under a wider generalization for which the evidence is still of the same kind though more extensive the progress of science is constantly producing such subsumptions and therefore giving a constantly wider inductive basis for scientific generalizations but although this gives a greater degree of certainty it does not give a different kind the ultimate ground remains inductive that is derived from instances and not an a priori connection of universals such as we have in logic and arithmetic two opposite points are to be observed concerning a priori general propositions the first is that if many particular instances are known our general propositions may be arrived at in the first instance by induction and the connection of universals may be only subsequently perceived for example it is known that if we draw perpendiculars to the sides of a triangle from the opposite angles all three perpendiculars meet in a point it would be quite possible to be first led to this proposition by actually drawing perpendiculars in many cases and finding that they always meet in a point this experience might lead us to look for the general proof and find it such cases are common in the experience of every mathematician the other point is more interesting and of more philosophical importance it is that we may sometimes know a general proposition in cases where we do not know a single instance of it take such a case as the following we know that any two numbers can be multiplied together and will give a third number called their product 
we know that all pairs of integers, the product of which is less than 100, have been actually multiplied together, and the value of the product recorded in the multiplication table. But we also know that the number of integers is infinite, and that only a finite number of pairs of integers ever have been, or ever will be, thought of by human beings. Hence it follows that there are pairs of integers which never have been, and never will be, thought of by human beings, and that all of them deal with integers, the product of which is over 100. Hence we arrive at the proposition, all products of two integers, which never have been and never will be thought of by any human being, are over 100. Here is a general proposition of which the truth is undeniable, and yet, from the very nature of the case, we can never give an instance, because any two numbers we may think of are excluded by the terms of the proposition. This possibility of knowledge of general propositions of which no instance can be given is often denied, because it is not perceived that the knowledge of such propositions only requires a knowledge of the relations of universals, and does not require any knowledge of instances of the universals in question. Yet the knowledge of such general propositions is quite vital to a great deal of what is generally admitted to be known. For example, we saw in our early chapters that physical objects, as opposed to sense data, are only obtained by an inference, and are not things with which we are acquainted. Hence, we can never know any proposition of the form, this is a physical object, where this is something immediately known. It follows that all our knowledge concerning physical objects is such that no actual instance can be given. We can give instances of the associated sense data, but we cannot give instances of the actual physical objects. Hence, our knowledge as to physical objects depends throughout upon this possibility of general knowledge where no instance can be given. And the same applies to our knowledge of other people's minds, or of any other class of things, of which no instance is known to us by acquaintance. We may now take a survey of the sources of our knowledge, as they have appeared in the course of our analysis. We have first to distinguish knowledge of things and knowledge of truths. In each there are two kinds, one immediate and one derivative. Our immediate knowledge of things, which we called acquaintance, consists of two sorts, according as the things known are particulars or universals. Among particulars we have acquaintance with sense data, and, probably, with ourselves. Among universals, there seems to be no principle by which we can decide which can be known by acquaintance. But it is clear that among those that can be so known are sensible qualities, relations of space and time, similarity, and certain abstract, logical universals. Our derivative knowledge of things, which we call knowledge by description, always involves both acquaintance with something and knowledge of truths. Our immediate knowledge of truths may be called intuitive knowledge, and the truths so known may be called self-evident truths. Among such truths are included those which merely state what is given in sense, and also certain abstract logical and arithmetical principles, and, though with less certainty, some ethical propositions. Our derivative knowledge of truths consists of everything that we can deduce from self-evident truths by the use of self-evident principles of deduction. If the above account is correct, all our knowledge of truths depends upon our intuitive knowledge. It therefore becomes important to consider the nature and scope of intuitive knowledge, in much the same way as at an earlier stage, 
we considered the nature and scope of knowledge by acquaintance. But knowledge of truths raises a further problem which does not arise in regard to knowledge of things, namely the problem of error. Some of our beliefs turn out to be erroneous, and therefore it becomes necessary to consider how, if at all, we can distinguish knowledge from error. This problem does not arise with regard to knowledge by acquaintance, for whatever may be the object of acquaintance, even in dreams and hallucinations, there is no error involved, so long as we do not go beyond the immediate object. Error can only arise when we regard the immediate object, that is, the sense datum, as the mark of some physical object. Thus, the problems connected with knowledge of truths are more difficult than those connected with knowledge of things. As the first of the problems connected with knowledge of truths, let us examine the nature and scope of our intuitive judgments. End of chapter 10